Et bonjour. Bonjour. Welcome, welcome to our interview for the Business Ethics Pioneers Project. Emmanuel, can you start us off on your interview with a little background about yourself? Um, <clears throat> I come from a, a, a regular uh, French middle class family uh, with a substantial story. I'm Parisian. I was born, raised, educated in Paris. Um, but also educated partly uh, in the U.S., one of the best times of my life uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, <clears throat> and I work for, uh, I started to work for an American law firm, the Bowers and Plimpton, uh, in, in they are based in New York. Uh, but they offered me the choice to start either in New York or in Paris. And uh, I thought it was better to do my first mistakes in, in Paris easier to my mother tongue uh, <coughs> in my home country so I started in Paris and then they sent me to New York great experience and back to Paris and after that I joined L'Oreal but it's not the main um, uh, in fact what really influenced me was uh, two things the, the, of course the, the, the education and the quality of my parents uh, self uh, made people uh, because of uh, history, because of the Shoah, they had to, uh, to quit school or they couldn't attend school. Um, so they started very early to, uh, in their life to, uh, to work. Um, and they had a very high level of, uh, I would say, moral and ethics. They never complained. But uh, a very nice, le uh, they show us, a very, uh, with my two brothers, a very nice way. Uh, how to how to behave uh, properly. Mm. Um, what uh, what had an influence uh, is a period of more or less ten years in my life um, when I work with um, with Sergeant Berta Klarsfeld. Um, they are known in uh, in Europe. They are known uh, in other countries as well. I assume in the states as well for being a Nazi hunter. And uh, I started to work with them uh, when I was 17, and uh, it had a great influence on, uh, on uh, my thinking. Uh, I understood very early that you can be uh, alone and you can move things. You can uh, shake things uh, and you can uh, prevail if you are right. And how did that sense that one person can shake things, one person can move things, how has that influenced how you've become the leader you are today in ethics? I'm not a big fan of uh, systems. <laughs> uh, I think that individuals can move things, and uh, okay. it's why uh, often um, in the conversation with, with colleagues or with uh, students or with people in, uh, in my team, I, I tell them that I think they should uh, uh, st study um, old authors. They should uh, study rhetorics, and it would be probably be, more, be as useful, if not more useful, than to study law um, to become a, a reasonably good uh, or reasonably proper uh, ethics officer. Mm -hmm. So tell us the story of how you became, went from, you, you were an attorney, you practiced around yeah. the globe, you were hired at L'Oréal, and then uh, fill me in on the gap between that moment and you now have a portfolio in the area of ethics. Yeah. What so I, uh, So let's start from, uh, from the end of, uh, uh, of what I did uh, at Du Bois. At the end of uh, my work at Du Bois and Plimpton, I was an employment and labor, uh, labor law attorney. Um, working for uh, employers uh, <coughs> and it was super interesting uh, just had the uh, opportunity to uh, to work for L'Oréal and to become a general counsel for human resources uh, and basically I created an uh, internal legal department mm -hmm. with the same methodology that the one I learned in this uh, great American law firm. <laughs> and 
I was always concerned about the, the ethical issues, about the moral side of things, and uh, very naturally, when there were ethical issues, they would, uh, they would come t to me. At that time, when we were talking about ethical issues, it was, to a large extent, uh, human resources issues, mm -hmm. sexual harassment, mobbing, bullying, discrimination, um, and the, it came to me as General Counsel for Human Resources, and probably also due to uh, the independence I, I showed very early in, uh, at L'Oréal, and uh, I was close to management, but uh, I always wanted to remain uh, very independent. Always thought it was one of the things I would uh, bring uh, to, to the company. Um, so, so I joined L'Oréal in 1999, and in 2000, L'Oréal published its first Code of Ethics. Um, I was not part of the team who uh, drafted the code. In fact, there are two or three people who really drafted the code. Um, it was superbly well drafted. The traditional French way, I would say, it was a piece of, uh, of nice uh, literature, <laughs> but no, no one would uh, really uh, read it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was um, um, uh, part, half of the uh, small booklet was in French and the other half was uh, in English. Okay. And mainly principle, and the idea was, as, uh, as this company is growing and becoming truly uh, international and then global, so it was a French company operating internationally, and then it became a European company uh, operating uh, also internationally, and now the idea is to be a true global corporation. Yeah? With, uh, and then we have, of course, uh, additional challenges if we want to right. succeed. Okay. Um, <coughs> so I started to review, not to, to draft really, but to review, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. it just uh, seemed obvious to everyone that if there is uh, an issue to be interpreted, if the code needed to be interpreted, I would be the one to interpret it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And it was written, it has been written in 2000 in the code, in the booklet. I was only one year old in this company. And this would be in your role as Human Resources yes. General Counsel? Yes, exactly. Okay, sure. Then in, um, in 2006, uh, Jean-Paul Agon became uh, Executive Director of, uh, of L'Oréal, and a little bit after he became pr uh, President Director General, oui, so oui. the CEO, oui, oui. full-fledged CEO. But when he... Um, when he took the job, when he succeeded to uh, Sir Lindsay Owen Jones, um, well, I knew him because we had to deal with various matters before together. Um, and uh, he, he asked me, Emmanuel, what do you want to do? And it has been a 15 second conversation. And I say, <laughs> ethics. We, we should create ethics. It will add value to the company mm -hmm. in a good sense. Okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, not only economically, but it will add values, I mean, moral values um, to the company. It will help to develop the, the right culture. So he, he, he said, okay, but uh, sh just show me something. He was sensitive to the matter mm -hmm. because he, he just before he took the job af at L'Oreal, he was a CEO of L'Oreal USA. Mm -hmm. So he had, I think, quite, uh, he had a, uh, I would say a uh, reasonable understanding of the ethics and compliance issues, at least of its uh, growing importance. Okay, I'm gonna stop you here with the story and go back in time just to clarify something if I can. And before you do that, can mm -hmm. I um, yeah. just do a quick readjust? Sure. Um, we Manuel, need can I have you get a little, scoot a little bit closer to me? Yes. Just a little, yeah. that's good. Good. And then, uh, Joan, mm -hmm. move a little bit here. Good. Okay. So, right. back on. Yep. Whenever you're ready. So go back to 1990, the year 2000. Mm -hmm. As you said, you're just 1999. a 1999. Right. You're you're just a one-year lawyer with mm -hmm. L'Oréal, 
you are the general counsel for human resources. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you said is that at that time, so many of the ethics questions were human resources related. Why do you think that was the case? Why does ethics show up first in the field of employer-employee relationships? Uh, clearly, because very few people had at that time the understanding that uh, the real issues, the tough mm -hmm. issues, the one we should really uh, tackle and address are business uh, issues, the business issues, mm -hmm. and have often little to do with uh, HR. But HR issues are very visible. Mm -hmm. uh, they are numerous. They need to be treated. Um, <coughs> and even today, I think uh, still uh, probably 70% uh, of the issues that are raised mm -hmm. are HR-related uh, issues. Mm -hmm. But, but <laughs> these issues are not the ones that can make a company fail, oh. or barely. They can make individuals fail, mm -hmm. sometimes high-ranking individuals, powerful people, but not the company. So you've got the majority of matters in the relationship, what I call the employer-employee relationship. Mm -hmm. It was an entrance, okay. let's say it was a door to, uh, it was uh, through HR, I was just opening the door to ethics and getting people to start to be accustomed to the field. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought we would uh, develop later on, mm -hmm. um, more business-related issues. Because um, when I started, uh, of course, I encountered resistance, but silent resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a generation, a little bit of generation issue. People really felt that they were nicely educated, mm -hmm. that they had good uh, morals, that uh, it would be totally inappropriate to have anyone uh, tell them uh, would, uh, what they should do or behave, mm -hmm. or even refer to, uh, to a code of ethics for them was improper. And for some of them, it was in contradiction with, uh, with uh, uh, religious uh, feelings. So early on, you encountered <coughs> some resistance, some barriers. Do you think that your, your history with Nazi hunting, with the, the Shoah, your parents' stories, do you think that helped you address some of those barriers? Well, it certainly helped me uh, uh, for at least uh, two counts, top of my mind. Probably I'll find <laughs> other okay. good reasons. Well, I would say uh, to have uh, understanding that time run for ethics, mm -hmm. that um, and we shouldn't be discouraged. If there is a mountain, let's go around the mountain. Mm -hmm. okay? Let's not uh, sacrifice yourself uh, going straight <laughs> against the mountain <laughs> and the resistance. So for to, to illustrate this with an, one example, um, in the 90s, in the year 2000, well, it was very customary. I cannot talk for uh, US-based corporation, but for European-based corporation, it was very customary uh, when you wanted to develop a program, make a change, uh, <coughs> implement a new policy or whatever, you, it's top down basically. Okay. Okay. You have uh, a few people who say what's the truth and what, how we should change, and it goes down to the organization. Um, but I realized that it would be, although I got some great support, uh, in particular from, uh, from Jean Paul Agon. Mm -hmm. has been very supportive. Uh, <coughs> but I realized that uh, I would lose all my energy, not courage, but <laughs> energy, uh, and that I should not try to convince corporate headquarters to change and then lead by example from corporate mm -hmm. and then call the countries, we operate in 70 countries, and then ask the countries to follow. Mm -hmm. I understood that it, it would not work because you had all the corporate department that of course felt, of, they felt threatened by this, by ethics, by this new thing. Um, legal department felt threatened, mm -hmm. HR felt threatened, 
uh, finance felt threatened, accounting felt threatened, operation, marketing, you name it, all the, all the area mm -hmm. of the company. So they would, uh, I, th I think at the beginning, they were interested, moderately cooperate, didn't see the legitimacy, mm -hmm. and it's a company where you need to have the legitimacy to uh, be able to move on. So what I did is instead of trying to change, uh, let's say, the, what is supposed to be the brain of the corporation, mm -hmm. um, I chose to, to, to change the countries. And, and, and tell uh, us the story how you few, did that. <laughs> just after a few, few years, uh, I start to visit the, to visit the countries, mm -hmm. um, everywhere we operate, um, <coughs> and to talk to people at every level of the organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at some point, uh, Jean-Paul Agon, the, the CEO, agreed that I would visit countries with him. So I was in the, let's say, presidential uh, circle, right. going with him, visiting the country. But you know what it is when you have a, the, the top of a large corporation visiting the operation mm -hmm. um, in other countries or overseas. It's like they're in a bubble, okay? So you see what you are shown. <laughs> um, so I understood yes. that it was a loss of time. Uh, mm -hmm. It was not the right positioning. It was not uh, a, a, a right, uh, I didn't have my moment to talk to people, mm -hmm. to interact, to understand what are the issues. Uh, uh, to feel also uh, whether they're interested or not. Um, and so I organize these uh, trips alone. Uh, and basically, um, you, go to, you go to a country, you have a dinner with a general manager. So you chit chat for, uh, for a dinner on Sunday, uh, Sunday evening. And then Monday morning, you see. I have ethics correspondent now, uh, so I see the ethics correspondent for a couple of hours to discuss also the issues mm -hmm. in the country. And then um, we have a meeting with a um, management committee of the country, everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And during this meeting, um, I do the business case for ethics, yes, because even after 10 years, it is still useful to continue to do the business case for mm -hmm. ethics. You have new generation that comes, and uh, it's still very useful to do it. Mm -hmm. But I do it in a way linked, v linked to the business, and I will give you an example okay. later. I just maybe want to give you an overview of the structure of these visits. Mm -hmm. So, um, the meeting with a uh, with a management committee lasts typically uh, three hours, followed by lunch. Um, when I enter the meeting. I would say 100% of the time, you can see that they are already bored. They don't want this. <laughs> they wonder why they are cold. They know this monetary because there's this guy from Paris who insti insisted to have this meeting. But they don't want it. They have so many things to do that are important as well. So, so they, they email, they look at the paper, everything. And you know, they, they feel it's monetary. They just come, some of them come to please uh, their boss. Okay. But at the end, um, mm -hmm. I would say today, without exception, at the end, they were all thrilled about it. They, they discover what ethics is, how powerful it can be, how powerful it can be for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they almost always say, you know, we, sh we should have a longer meeting and address more cases. Right. So, so what I do is uh, I, we work on real cases. Uh, cases that happen in a company, mm -hmm. um, real ethical dilemmas or situ a complex situation, crisis situation, mm -hmm. uh, where w some situation where we look nice, some situation where we don't look uh, that nice, mm -hmm. or situation where it is difficult to explain what is our position and why we did things a certain way. Um, <coughs> And they, they love it because also they realize what it is to make an ethical decision. So because I explain the case, and then it's a lot of interaction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, <coughs> and of course, during this meeting, we have discussion about the, the issues uh, they encounter in a, in a specific uh, country. And it's followed always by an individual meeting 
with every single general manager, with every member of the management committee. I have an individual interview with, mm -hmm. with him or her, always. And um, this interview helped me to assess uh, the sensitivity mm -hmm. to, the, to the matter. Mm -hmm. um, but the, inter the purpose of the interview is also to discuss with them what do they want to do to exercise their ethical leadership, practically. And what did you hear? What ideas did your general <coughs> managers, your senior teams at the yeah. country level, what did they bring forward? Well, at the, the, they, um, I think that um, after this morning session, in the afternoon they're much more, they're really listening and they want to do good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, they are lacking, often they are lacking ideas. Some have really great ideas, have really found they, they really want uh, to do something active, they want to communicate about it, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to put it on the agenda, it's one of the recommendations, to put on the agenda of their own management committee, ethical question, uh, question mark, mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. to show their interest for the ethical mm -hmm, issue, to mm -hmm, encourage mm -hmm. people to speak up. We discuss what they can do to uh, encourage the team to speak up, okay. Okay, because the uh, speak up is, uh, in fact, there are two sides of one coin. Speak up mm -hmm. and listening actively. We cannot ask people to speak up if there is no active listening on the other side. So it goes together. So we work on the active listening. And um, most of the, well, I would say all corporations who have an sort of ethics program have values. Mm -hmm. L'Oreal has four, integrity, respect, courage, and transparency. And what we do during this interview, I say, look, um, your team member, what they want to, to know is how you think, how you make decisions. And you, can, you should explain to them when you make a decision, a difficult decision, okay, uh, why you made the decision, what is your drive mm -hmm. behind your decision. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what you can do as a manager is use the four principles and tell your team, you don't need to be, to, to say it's ethics, it's our ethical value. Just say, you know, in terms of integrity, we should do that or not do that. Or we should have the courage to cut this client or develop this client who okay. uh, is doing uh, sure. things the proper way. Um, or transparency, what does that mean to be transparent mm -hmm. between colleagues? What does that mean to be transparent uh, in the, let's say, the reporting line, etc.? What does it mean to be transparent with the consumers, etc.? So the, the idea is mm -hmm. to encourage them to mm -hmm. use the four principles in their management, in their day-to-day -day management, right. so that they transmit something. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, you know, your team, they will love you for that. So what you've described is rather than from corporate headquarters in Paris radiating down and out a program, you flipped that model yes. and you went to the field. Yeah, the idea is instead of having a top-down program, right. to have a bottom-up bottom program. Up. And, th and this idea came with uh, the creation of the second edition of the Charter of Ethics. Okay. The first one was in 2000, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the second one was in 2007. Okay? So uh, it was an important moment because uh, Jean-Paul Agon was uh, appointed in 2006, and one of his first decisions was to create, uh, let's say, my department or my position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm. It's not a job, it's a mission. Okay. okay. So it's not a job in an organigram, okay, right. with a budget, with powers, authorities, responsibilities, mm -hmm. all this, okay. It's, uh, it's, it's really, it's a mission. And the, the, the most important thing, for him, it was very clear in our discussion. Mm -hmm. The most important is who you appoint. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, I learned a great expression uh, in the US: "Pancakes in, pancakes out." <laughs> so, um, in French, we say, "You know, avec des crêpes, on fait des crêpes." Oui, okay. oui, oui. So it's the same idea, and um, I think the most important choice is really who you appoint. Mm -hmm. If you have a weak person, you will have a weak weak results. Sure. So it is very much telling, mm -hmm. not on the ethics officer, but very much telling on management. 
as to who they Who's asked appointed? to take this a, a position. Of course. Okay. Now, remember you were saying that you knew that there would be some barriers and resistance, and you uh, described it as a natural kind of resistance. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I was not vexed by this resistance mm -hmm. at the beginning. Uh, very, no, uh, at the very beginning, I was sick, really, of, of this. Okay. Physically, it okay. was really painful. But then I realized that it's, uh, it's normal. Mm -hmm. And it's even a good sign. And uh, today, like though, healing. right, so today, 2018, yeah. right? But how many years is that? So you've now been in role. Let's say for yeah for more than ten years. For more than ten years, mm -hmm. has that resistance increased or has it decreased? It how has is, decreased. How has your strategy worked? Well, it has decreased. But first of all, um, the 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 strategy or to to rely on the country so mm -hmm. that the country mm -hmm. push uh, the rest of the company to right. um, uh, to move. Uh, I think has been uh, overall quite uh, mm -hmm. successful. Okay. Now it is spread. Everyone recognizes that ethics is now the fourth or the fifth pillar of the of the company. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is a, a change of culture. It is a c continuing process, uh, of course. Um, but at the same time, I uh, so I'm never satisfied mm -hmm. where, where we are. So I'm opening new avenues mm -hmm. and opening new uh, labor, new work, right. um, new areas, and right. governance areas. I think are very important. Um, I think it's important to make sure that there is um, a very good balance in a sacred uh, couple, which is power and responsibility. Okay. If you have the power. You must incur the responsibility. Right. If you have the responsibility, you must mm -hmm. have the power. And many of the problems uh, we face in terms of governance mm -hmm. in our organizations mm -hmm. is because there is an imbalance. Okay. So to address this issue is um, can be uh, if you don't feel strong enough, mm -hmm. uh, it can be uh, uh, career threatening. Mm -hmm. And. And um, th there are subjects when you start to address them, you feel, you know, maybe uh, I have no job tonight. But at the same time, that's my personal <laughs> thing. Because uh, I, your, I say that to, my, to, to Jean Paul Agon, he said, uh, You're crazy. So, um, so uh, sometimes you really feel that what you are asking or mm -hmm. what you are doing. Mm -hmm. Is um, it can represent a, a professional suicide. Okay, but so well, uh, uh, stop sick. I want to make sure we talk about some of the business ethics, those big reputational, threatening to the organization questions mm -hmm. that you were talking about at the very beginning. There's a plenitude of human resources ethics questions, yeah. but they don't have the same. Uh, risk quotient or reputational impact as some of the business ethics ones. So if you could, I'd like to explore some of those business ethics questions. Mm -hmm. I'd love to also hear your reflections on what we used to call making the choice about is this the hill you want to die on? Which, which matters are you willing to really push forward, though they could be threatening to your own career but are very important to the longevity of the organization. So if you ask me a straight question, yeah, uh, yeah. I'll answer okay. <laughs> almost as straight. <laughs> so, okay, so, so no. So, 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 so let's, let's go, go back, back on. To, to the issues. Yeah, yeah. So, so besides the HR issues, mm -hmm. the, the business related issues uh, can uh, can affect uh, probably much more the company. Mm -hmm. um, just to, 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 to give a, a general uh, thinking on this, I think that of the ethics, uh, or the, the integrity, the culture of integrity of an organization um, is uh, probably um, one of the, the quality of its culture 
is probably one of the best indicator of the sustainability of this organization. And one of the big flow today mm -hmm. and <coughs> is, is the fact that when you want to appraise a, an, a company, you look at the chairs, you look at the table, um, you look at the machine, the factories, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So you have accounts. Um, you look at the financial results, at the economical results, um, and you have a pretty good understanding of uh, the company worth. But you have, but if you really want to know how this company is likely to do in the future and whether it will be a sustainable company, um, you have, of course, to look at how we reach that, that these wonderful numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and it's super necessary <laughs> to look carefully at this. Right. Um, so, so I think we should double the, the economic and financial account mm -hmm. with a second set of accounts um, about the culture of integrity and the culture right. of, of the organization. And it's a, I think it's a necessary indicator. It's not just a nice plus, it's a necessary indicator. So one of the challenges is the the measurement, the metrics around ethical culture. Yes. And being able to assess that because it's part of the value, overall value of the yeah, entity. Yeah, a company sure. where uh, individuals, members of the company, right. feel free to speak up, right. makes better decisions. Sure. If we're in a meeting and uh, I'm scared to speak up, well, I know we are making a wrong decision, okay. but I'm scared of my boss, so I don't, uh, I shut up. So we, we will likely make a wrong decision. Sure. So speaking up is not about denouncing. Right. Yeah, just being able to express it, ourselves. So speaking up means, in your in your uh, understanding, to be able to challenge and look at different perspectives or different ideas. Of course. Or even be the contrarian. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. In decision making. Yeah. Can you give us any other examples that you would you want to look at? You have the issue. Uh, well, let's uh, take some example linked to the business. Okay. Uh, we sell mascara. Okay, L'Oreal is one of the world expert in mascara, right, if not the right, world right. expert in mascara. I am wearing L'Oreal mascara. Okay, very good. <laughs> so, uh, in advertisement, sometimes we use uh, fake eyelashes. Mm -hmm. Now, is it proper or improper? I think there's no problem to use fake eyelashes to the extent that they are not longer than natural eyelashes. If they are substantially bigger than natural eyelashes, I don't see any problem uh, also, uh, because uh, let's say the lie is so big that no one will uh, believe that it has nothing to do with the reality. But what if it is a fraction of a millimeter longer than natural eyelashes? That's where the ethical issue mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, at the beginning when I addressed this issue, I had a conversation with a colleague and, and friend who uh, um, who is in, uh, in, involved in the legal issues on the legal side, so the general counsel, and uh, he, he told me, but Emmanuel, there are no issue, we have the right to do it. And it was a great moment, mm -hmm. um, because he was deeply convinced that because we had the right to do it, which is, it was true at the time, mm -hmm. there is no problem how ethics could dare to get involved in this because we have the right to do it. So I told him, look, thank you so much. It's just the start of the conversation. If we have the right to do it, let's talk about is it the right thing to do? And for, for him, it was a big surprise, mm -hmm. this, this approach. At the time, it was really, uh, it was, uh, probably more common uh, in the States, but less common, uh, I would say, in Europe, within cooperation. Is it the right thing to do? And even today, when we discuss, is it the right thing to do? It is not always that obvious. Okay. We still need to continue to make the business case for ethics. Why to do the right thing uh, is uh, proper, is the thing mm -hmm. we, we should do. So. So this issue around mascara was, um, <coughs> uh, has been um, in many of the conversations uh, 
focus point and help to understand the difference between compliance and ethics. And um, in that regard, I always thought that the logic between compliance and the logic between ethics are um, partly uh, in, in reconcilable. You, you cannot okay. reconcile them. Okay? Um, <coughs> when we ask people to, uh, to follow the law, it's of course it's needed. It's a it's a basic, okay? It's a one on one behavior. Business or oh, sorry, behavior one on one. Okay? Follow the law, respect the law. Uh, but basically when you ask people just to follow the law, you ask them to obey. If um, there are people in my team I don't trust, I will ask them to obey. I say follow my instruction. Don't think just obey to my instruction. Okay. If I trust people, if I trust them as individuals, as human, as human beings, I will not ask them to obey. I will ask them to understand, to agree, to share the same values, the same goals, the same objectives, mm -hmm. and to understand what they are doing. And it's probably where ethics lies much more, in the sense that when um, I really believe that in an organization, what is super important is to remain uh, human being centric. Um, and so we have to trust people as individuals. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there is no hope, truly. Why well, robots uh, are fine. Sure. Okay? Let's be replaced by robots. Right. So if we just want people to obey. So uh, if we trust people, I think that uh, ethics programs should be based on values, mm -hmm. on shared values. And you spoke about L'Oreal's values, respect, integrity, mm -hmm. courage, and transparency. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how you, how you articulated those four specific values, well, you, particularly to, to L'Oreal? Yeah, to explain, uh, well, I start, for instance, I start by, uh, just to be practical, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, mm -hmm. I start by taking the values um, and discussing, uh, it could be in a town hall meeting with uh, all employees of a mm -hmm. business unit, and I say, look, imagine one minute that you are a marketing manager. You are the boss, and uh, one of one a member of your team come to you and say, oh, I have a great idea, I want to uh, advertise this new skin care, and I want to say, uh, to claim, that if you use my skin care, you will look 30 years younger. Okay. Can you do it from an ethical standpoint? Can you say, Use this skin care and you look 30 years younger. Ethically, there is no problem to say that, provided it is supported by scientific data mm -hmm. and proven performances. Otherwise, we cannot say it. Okay? It would be a lie. So would it be acting with integrity to take the first value? And say, no, we can't. In terms of integrity, mm -hmm. we cannot do it. Mm -hmm. So, and what is the second, let's sort of second step uh, in the reasoning? How this issue comes or play with respect? Same, if we make this claim, saying you will look 30 years younger if you use this skin care, and if, we, and if we know it's wrong, that it's not supported by scientific data and proven performances, it would be a lack of respect for your consumers. Mm -hmm. It would be a lack of respect for your clients. Right. And it would be a lack of respect for the brand. Because when you are the boss, the head of a brand, mm -hmm. your job is to build, to nurture the brand, to build the brand, to respect the brand, mm -hmm. to build it long term, okay? right. not through lies. And where does courage come in? Integrity? It takes courage. Yes, where's the courage part? It takes courage to, uh, to raise an issue. Okay. And courage is not the most widespread uh, 
character, mm -hmm. I would say of human beings, in general, and in uh, our organization. And this, I, w I would make no difference, mm -hmm. regardless of, uh, of, the, of the countries. I think in almost every culture, mm -hmm. um, you, you find uh, uh, courage, I would say, is an issue. At the same time, you find people who uh, demonstrate uh, beautiful courage. So um, I think courage helps us to understand that um, to speak up, it takes courage. Okay? To do the right thing, it takes courage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, people agree that uh, they would feel better okay, when they look back at their career or mm -hmm. at their life mm -hmm. if they had demonstrated courage. Okay. Um, they understand the, the, the value of courage and they understand that they can use this concept of courage sometimes to push for the right decision. Okay. So think to put it about in a conversation. Yeah. Okay. Say, Let's have okay. the courage to okay. talk about it. Okay. And even using the word courage changes the tone of the conversation yeah. in the moment. When you put, when you have a, 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 a meeting, mm -hmm. um, and at some point, you see that everyone has his or her position, or the, all the power struggles. So I would say usual, uh, usual business. When you put the word courage, uh, um, it changes the tone of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Because you put the f your finger on someone that on something that can hurt, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it helps to. Um, um, some time to discuss more openly what are the real issues because okay. very often in meetings we discuss uh, everything be except the real, uh, the real issue. Sure. Um, it's why transparency comes in, mm -hmm. is uh, important mm -hmm. um, and it's important to, uh, to put into place this concept of transparency which uh, I think is, has um, uh, probably um, more operation meaning in the 21st century. Okay. Um, I really believe that transparency is one of the key concepts for our century. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm. we better understand that the, the requirement from the market in terms of transparency, sure. the requirement from the people in terms of transparency are um, <coughs> very high and very powerful. Mm -hmm. Just in the last, um, so Today we are in 2018, yeah, the beginning of 2018. But uh, last year, I visited uh, about 25, let's say more than 20 countries. Um, and at the end of the year, I visited some countries that helped me think about uh, issues that I think are relevant for uh, our mission. Okay. Uh, I went to South Korea mm -hmm. in a short term mm -hmm. time of mm -hmm. period. Uh, within almost the same month, I went to uh, South Korea. I went to uh, Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, to the, to the States. And uh, there were three pending uh, public uh, issues. And I was I almost in each country when it uh, happened. So you have the arrest of these 200 business uh, people Prince and ministers right. in Saudi Arabia. Right. Um, you have the Weinstein uh, issue in, in the States. Mm -hmm. And um, in Korea, you have the issue with the, with the president of uh, South Korea um, and who uh, lost her job. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she's in prison. Uh, even today, she's mm -hmm. in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that she has not been indicted. There is no. No, no process. What is very interesting is that in, in South Korea, you had several hundred thousand people who uh, went in the street with a lighter to protest against the president and mm -hmm. to ask for justice after, you know, the mm -hmm. boat sink with several hundred kids. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, really a shame for the South Korean uh, society and a revelator. Mm -hmm. It reveals uh, deeper issues in terms of corruption as well. Mm -hmm. And 
people asked for justice, not it was not the regular institution. Mm -hmm. And the, it was so powerful that she ended up in prison. Of course, there was sort of process, the Supreme Court uh, let this happen, all this, mm -hmm. but it's uh, basically, it is a f force of the people in the street that did not really believe in the regular public institution and that leads to this ending. And how does that it's impact? It's not the end. The I come back to the, yes. second, so the okay. two other okay. things, the sure. US sure. and Saudi Arabia. Okay. In Saudi Arabia, you had this very powerful people who have been arrested, uh, almost all of them over the weekend, mm -hmm. uh, uh, about uh, just a number I read in newspapers, so I, I didn't count myself, but uh, <laughs> the number is so big that I have difficulties to understand how much it is, but 100 billion uh, dollar frozen uh, assets. Mm -hmm. And what is very interesting is that no process, through regular institution, yeah. and um, old files that, that resurface, old corruption issues that resurface. Mm -hmm. So in other words, um, the, let's say the regular institution um, <coughs> probably didn't do their job to uh, um, to the extent expected, um, so there were a lot of issues that has been swept under the carpet mm -hmm. and resuscitated 10, 15 years after by, uh, <coughs> uh, by a prince uh, for various reasons. Yeah? But what's interesting is the absence of due process and old stories. Mm -hmm. But in the States, it's the same with the Weinstein case. Mm -hmm. I mean, from my perspective, it's just uh, the same. It's uh, all stories, uh, right or wrong, I, I don't know, but probably let's say, uh, let's assume that they are right. Um, all stories, in many cases, no process, it basically is a is a public opinion tribunal. And I think it's, um, it is not new. What is new mm -hmm. is a multiplication of oh, cases. Okay. 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 It's not, uh, it happened in the past, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, I, but uh, I, think, I think it's interesting to see that um, the new generations, um, who are tired, don't want to wait uh, maybe for the regular process, don't trust it enough. Mm -hmm. uh, they want justice right now with their understanding of justice. Okay? It's not proper justice. What happened in, uh, not, I'm not talking about Weinstein, right? but what happened for Weinstein and for the 100 or more than 100 mm -hmm. other people who within hours sometime or a couple of days lost everything. They, uh, I am sure that many of them, it's, uh, let's say, my heart would say, it's proper and maybe it's not enough. Okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But professionally, <laughs> it is very disturbing. Right. Very disturbing in the 21st century in the States mm -hmm. that so this can happen. As we look towards the next generation, of people who are, like you, a champion for ethics inside of organizations. You've talked about some of the battles you've fought, some mm -hmm. of those you've won, some of those you've skirted around. You've, you've talked a lot about some of the strategies you've used. Well, one secret is don't ask for permission. Okay. <laughs> and I think one of the greatness of, um, uh, of senior management of L'Oreal and uh, is that uh, they, I don't know if they close their eyes, but at least they let it happen. That most mm -hmm. of the programs we have developed in the last 10 years, I didn't ask for permission. Okay. Because when you ask for permission, basically you ask, you, you try to find someone who will say no and that you can blame for not doing something. Mm -hmm. um, 
So if you really believe in it, uh, do it. Huh? Sure. So, and uh, I think it's one of the secrets, especially if you are in a big organization. Mm -hmm. And what is amazing is that when you do dare to do things, when you don't ask for permission, mm -hmm. when you run a little bit uh, above uh, budget, or when you send uh, policies or memos, you, didn't, you are not sure that there is uh, this type of huge consensus mm -hmm. that serves to cut it to small pieces, any new policy. So if you don't go through this route, mm -hmm. um, through the moulinette, the corporate moulinette, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> I think you have a better chance of success. And one of the discovery, um, uh, one of the things I learned as I walked is the fact that uh, if you really, if you have the will, it's possible. Mm -hmm. And you can, with a very small team, mm -hmm. um, you can have, a, you can have an influence, you can contribute to change things. Mm -hmm. This is really the big lesson, is uh, um, in that sense, large organizations mm -hmm. uh, are very, very weak, much weaker than we think. And there are plenty of possibilities mm -hmm. uh, to, to move on okay. in the right direction. Sure. Let me ask my last question. Yes. You are, first of all, a fabulous interviewee. You are, a, a, uh. it's a joy to ask you about what you've done. Is there anything else that you'd like to record or think about in terms of your own legacy? in the field of ethics, and that could be our, our, our really our last question, our okay. last area. What's so, your legacy? Okay, uh, well to start with, uh, <coughs> there's no legacy, <laughs> uh, <coughs> because uh, I'm one of the young guy uh, over 50, uh, and I intend to remain like this right. a long time, so. Um, no, I think the first one is really, don't ask for permission, I think it's okay. super important. Um, <coughs> to. Um, I think if you are, if you have a strong team with uh, 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 with great people who are convinced of the same, you can achieve a lot, much more than if you have a large, a large team. You don't need to have a huge budget. Uh, you, I think you don't need to uh, homemade uh, homemade food is yeah. better <laughs> uh, than processed food, and. Um, I have the same opinion for uh, for consultant. I think that uh, that uh, we should, um, to the extent possible, avoid a consultant and do things homemade. Really mm -hmm. create mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. right. Uh, and uh <coughs> I think it's a. Uh, I felt it was a tremendous source of. Uh, loss of time, l loss of resources, of course. So very mm -hmm. early on, I just uh, gave up on this mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to create mm -hmm. our own thing. Um, and then you you fail, you try, you move on. All this is fine. Sure. Uh, but people realize uh, that we have a very deep and strong conviction. We, we discuss about real story. We, we try not to avoid the difficult subject, to address mm -hmm. them in all their complexity. Um, um, one of the one of the illustration um, of the difficulty between uh, respect for the law and respect for the values is <coughs> has been offered through a real story. Let's say on the basis of a real story. Um, then I c created work, work up a little bit, work on, this, on the fact so that it become more clear, um, uh, and made up a little bit the fact so that we, we see better the contradiction. If you operate, let's say you operate in a country where <coughs> um, adultery is prohibited, and you are the boss of this country, two of your employees married, are in an adultery relationship. Mm -hmm. According to the law of the country, <coughs> you can have all type of punishment, including uh, the higher punishment, which is to be sentenced to death through stoning. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the ultimate punishment uh, um <coughs> if there are aggravating circumstances, whatever. But let's say that's uh, that's a risk. 
And you have an obligation to denounce crimes. And this is a crime in, in this country. And you, if you know about the situation, you must denounce it. Yeah. So what do you do? You want to comply with the law, right? And because on every wall, I'm sure, you write that uh, your commitment to the world, to the board, to the shareholders, to all the stakeholders, is to respect the law. So if you respect the law, you go straight to, to the local police and you denounce your two employees, and you know that there is to be stoned to death. How does it fly with your values? What do you do? And that's this type of dilemma that we address and others huh, that are less heavily charged, I would say, even including emotionally, um, that we address so that people understand that to, to manage is not easy. But when you are the boss, you have to boss les patrons patron. So oui. if you are the boss, boss, that's your job, is to decide. When ethics is concerned, silence is not an option. And that's key. And I feel very strongly about it. Because when I look at history, including the history of my own family, mm -hmm. I would have loved people not to keep silent. I would have loved more people, to be fair. Mm -hmm. More people not to keep silent. So I do know deeply inside how much harm silence can do. And I feel strong to communicate this mm -hmm. um, because I know it's right. We cannot remain silent. We have to make a decision. We have to speak up. We have to stand up for what is right. <coughs> so to address these dilemmas mm -hmm. is very is uh, is uh, great because you see, some people say, "Sorry, that's the law. Mm -hmm. That's the law." Mm -hmm. You have people who say, "Are you you know, totally nuts? What about let's say basic human rights?" Mm -hmm. So we have super healthy discussion. And we realize collectively that through speaking up, we get closer to the truth and to reaching a, a great decision. Because we learn together to think longer term. Mm -hmm, yeah? mm -hmm. We look at the consequences if we take one position or the other. And it's very helpful in the context of management. But I do that with uh, employees, even in factories. Factories, distribution center at every level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they love it. They love that we. We, we show that uh, by addressing this type of difficult issues, in fact, we bring trust on the table and in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And to discuss ethical dilemmas with uh, workers who are uh, working on the line in a factory uh, in the middle of, um, of uh, nowhere in various countries, it brings them a lot of uh, of, of, of joy and pride, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. pride to, to work for this uh, organization. Yeah. Now, don't be mistaken. Uh, uh, this organization is not perfect. What is good in this organization is that it's a learning organization, um, that we confront and we learn to confront issues. Um, but to have problem, it's normal. No, it's, uh, sure. Any regrets? Is there, when you look back at what you've done so far, and as you're right, you've just <coughs> had chapter one and chapter two. You mm -hmm. have many more chapters of your career ahead of you. Any regrets at this point about decisions not taken, challenges that you uh, uh, took uh, on or should no, have taken on? I have on? no regrets because in, in um, a few few cases, it was quite rare. I think I really stand up for what I thought was okay. right. Okay. Um, uh, also, really, in most of the cases, uh, I was so lucky, so fortunate that uh, I've been followed. Or, uh, in few instances, that's not been the case. And uh, it brings a lot of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a process. And um, <coughs> and you cannot uh, win every battle. I think it's suspicious when you win uh, all the battles. 
um, <clears throat> there is probably a problem somewhere. So um, it's normal to lose battle, and it's even great. It's good. You learn so much. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I have no regret. Uh, what I'm thinking about the, the most is not the past, okay? it's the future. Okay. Is what's the uh, issues for tomorrow. And what are, what are those, what do you think are the next set of challenges? Well, I would say there are two. One is governance, in terms okay. of governance. I okay. think that ethics officer uh, will have and must have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. Today, mm -hmm. it's uh, when you say that, people look at you like uh, you're a monster. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's okay. Let, let me, let me interrupt here. Uh, a seat at the table as governance. Governance as in senior executive? Yes. Governance as in board of directors? Uh, no, I would say in the... Uh, in executive committee. Okay, okay. Yeah. So when I talk about governance, I talk about, um, um, the, let's say, the highest, the first circle okay. around the number one, okay. uh, whatever the name. Sure, sure. Um, and um, I think it's uh, necessary. What, what is happening, what is happening at the moment? I think that uh, there is a phenomenon, a silent phenomenon, but very powerful, is that The, in the history of hum, humanity, there have always been innovation. Okay. Okay. Small technical innovation, and today, much larger technical innovation. The second phenomenon is that it's faster and faster. Okay. Right. Every year or every ten years, it's much faster. The speed of innovation is faster. Right. Now, traditionally, when there was a technical innovation or a scientific innovation, mm -hmm. with it came issues, including ethical issues. Mm -hmm. And the legislator was there to help give a framework and address this issue in a reasonable way. Let's put it that way. So basically, you have an innovation. Uh, with innovation, we discover issues, problems uh, for the society, and the uh, law comes in to solve it. But today, it's not the case any longer. When you look at the innovation in biotechnology, it's mm -hmm, not the case. Mm -hmm. When you think about innovation with self-driving cars, it's not the case. When you think about big data issues, it's not the case. Uh, when you think about robotization, all, all these brings so many uh, new challenges right. and very fast. And the law is late, too late. And yet we have to, you, to make decisions. How do you make decisions? We make decisions mm -hmm. according to our values, to our ethics. So mm -hmm. I think that when the speed of innovation and when the speed of, mm -hmm. di of scientific discovery is faster than the speed of legal production, ethics rise. Okay. And this is a phenomenon we are right in. I think we don't see it, but we are right <laughs> in it. And that ethics is rising. Mm -hmm. um, And the, the, the power of the law, um, the power of values are going up, the power of the law is going down, just because it, it is not a tool adapted mm -hmm. to, uh, to, uh, For speed. to many of our challenges. Right, right. It's too late. And this is a deep change. At the moment, I think it's invisible. It's silent, but it's coming. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want your kid to build by the hour, they better study philosophy rather than law. Yeah. And these are, in some ways, some it of the will challenges. It be a table if they yeah. build by the hour, <laughs> by the way. But uh, let's say I think that There are little new things uh, in philosophy, really. Uh, almost not everything has been said, but a lot of things have been said. Mm -hmm. We just need to, what is happening is we renovate it. Right. Uh, but um, <coughs> we resuscitate a lot of mm -hmm. uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this will be uh, prevalent in many, of the, in many of the decisions. And it's interesting to see that some of the major players um, uh, in California, for instance, are mm -hmm. creating mm -hmm. external bodies 
to uh, think about the ethical issues because they do because it's a strategic issue and they know that if they make the wrong decision mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of ethics they are sure they are, I don't know if we should say cooked or done <laughs> but they are uh, they will not last sure the, the consequences <coughs> of ethical failure when we look at big issues like big data, artificial intelligence, CRISPR gene technology, gene cutting and manipulation technology, artificial intelligence, the use of drones, of self-replicating uh, robotic entities mm -hmm. that have been programmed to create themselves, those have huge impacts mm -hmm. on how we live our everyday lives mm -hmm. and how corporate organizations live their everyday lives. Oh, I'm very sure. optimistic, in fact. Okay. Because? Because I, I think that we'll find uh, the solution in, in ourselves. Okay. We need to Excellent. have the courage to bring ethics uh, at the table. Okay. Wonderful. That's the only requirement. It's why this governance issue is a prerequisite. And as you say, that's the, the bona fide seat at the highest executive leadership levels of the organization. Yeah, to have a say. Have a say. Okay? That's to a be part super of important. Yeah. To be understood. Yeah. And um, in the personal relationship, the, you, when you are ethics officer, the personal mm -hmm. relationship you have with uh, number one in the organization mm -hmm. is important. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. If there is no trust, uh, it's a big suffering. Right. Um, one of the powerful uh, practical uh, things that happen I in, in the relationship between the CEO and the ethics officer in, in my company was that the uh, CEO accepted the idea mm. that um, it's okay, that's his role to decide, okay? mm -hmm. but he must listen to his ethics officer okay. until the conversation is over. Okay? It may take an hour. It may take two hours, it may require three meetings. And what is absolutely great is that for the important issue, he agreed mm -hmm. to do that. So we Excellent. can discuss until the end. Right. Okay? So I would not buy authority, uh, I would not buy um, argument of authority. Mm -hmm. okay? And you know, and often in a question, you need to reflect what has been said. Sure. Yeah, it's in the sure. evening when you, sure. <laughs> you think you say, oh, we haven't addressed this right. uh, angle. But what you have agreed, and obviously is being a maintained agreement over time, is how the executive will take that decision. And it's <coughs> with consultation with you on the ethical aspects of those decisions until you're through with the consultation. Yeah. So you And that's respect. Yeah. And truly, what I fight for yeah. is respect. I want ethics okay. to be respected. Good. Good. Okay? And I'm not imposing uh, a, a decision, but I'm imposing the thinking process. Correct. The how you make the decision is yes. super important. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. This is fabulous. Any other questions that you've got? Gretchen, anything to add? This is, we've been keeping you in the chair for now an hour and a no, half. No, no problem. Um, if I have a cookie, it's just, I can't. It's just fabulous. Yes. Yes. No? One of the things I'd like to hear you talk about is your vision for the future. How do we bring young people into this field? And I know you worked closely with Roxana. You got the program started at Sergi. That was really something at the time yeah. that you thought was going to make a difference and that you believed in. And I wonder if we could capture sort of... Yeah, but at the same time, uh, I try to lead by example for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I quit when I'm not satisfied. <laughs> so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, because I thought that I, I always had thought the genesis of that program was really something very interesting, and I'd like to capture that okay. as part of the okay. journey here in education. So thinking about how we teach, what do we do, who's going to teach, those ideas. I okay. Think. So Preparing the next generation. Absolutely. Yeah. Get up and stretch. Can we go to the back? Um, okay. So. Right. No. You're ready. We're rolling. I plenty of things I could say, but some, some, some are so good surprise. No, I'm not surprised. I think that in this field, yeah. it's hard to say because they, they are so, so much um, um, 
stigma attached to, uh, to this type of comments. But historically, I found that within the corporation, there are exceptions, of course, and great people, yeah, but um, the people who, who moved, who were ready to, uh, to stand up, mm -hmm. were women. Okay. And that's and particular to L'Oréal or to all corporations? I don't think, well, I, uh, I don't know as, uh, elsewhere, but um, <coughs> I don't know elsewhere, but I found mm -hmm. that on difficult issues, the ones that eventually made uh, the more, most often decisions based on principle mm -hmm. um, were women. And more ready to stand up for mm. for for principle. Now, I must say that with the new generation, Generation Z, uh, I feel it's a bit different. Okay, mm -hmm. but you know, it's not statistic. It's just uh, my own little reality. Right. Um, but if I take, uh, let's say, a more mature generation. Um, I found more women that were interested in the field, mm -hmm. more women that were listening, and more women that were ready to stand up. Okay. Um, and who did not use uh, ethics for the wrong purpose. Tell me more about using ethics for the right purpose and using ethics for the wrong purpose. Well, you, you can uh, uh, <coughs> use ethics to, to kill the career of someone. You know, it's very common. It was mm -hmm. At the beginning, I think it was uh, 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 common, or every, let's say, every quarter, I would mm -hmm. have a case of someone who tried to, to hurt a colleague okay. through uh, the ethical route. And so. that would be a denunciation? Or yeah, or the, you know, they raise ethical issues uh, that just hide uh, poor performance, mm -hmm. and, but they didn't want to. They didn't have the courage to address the poor performance. Okay, they should do. They should have addressed it. So mm -hmm. instead of that, they uh, they thought they could rely on a so-called be individual behavior issue to right. uh, to get rid of someone. So um, it's normal that people try. It's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. that, uh, it's normal to try. Um, so it didn't work out, so now um, I think no one reasonable would try. So that, I that hope so, it can happen. But, uh, but, but that avenue of, I would call it seeking internal revenge, mm -hmm. may have been prevalent, but you don't see it so much today. No, I think uh, no, today okay. it would be really, uh, I think, I think no one would dare really to do that. Okay, now. okay. It wouldn't fly. Okay. Yeah. Tell me about your experiences in training or preparing the next generation of ethics officers for corporations. Do you have some observations about how individuals mm -hmm. in your own position ensure that there are subsequent generations ready to step in the shoes at some point? Well, there, there are various duties associated with the type of uh, mission we carry, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, including to uh, help raise and train new generation mm -hmm. people who push you, who are smarter than you, who bring issues, right. who uh, put you in a corner, like it happened this morning with uh, someone in my team okay. who uh, disagree with uh, the position I had on mm -hmm. the matter, mm -hmm. and he sent me a note that was not pleasant to read. He was absolutely right, and, um, and that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So we had a, a very interesting uh, discussion later today uh, about this. He, he stood up for what he felt was the right thing. Okay. Yeah. And um, he wanted to make sure that uh, we were not taking a decision that would mean a double standard and mm -hmm. what that mm -hmm. would protect powerful mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, the way he um, he drafted his uh, his note was uh, was great. 
Uh, not only strong convictions, mm -hmm. but uh, well argumented. So, um, <coughs> um, and after we discussed, I uh, haven't told him yet, but uh, um, I found a way to reopen uh, the matter. Uh, <coughs> So that we uh, uh, we eventually make something that is uh, fair and more long term oriented. Okay. Okay. And I like that. I like that because I feel good. I mm -hmm. feel that mm -hmm. we have people in a pipeline. Um, <coughs> and individuals like the the employee who 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 challenged you today mm -hmm. earlier today by yeah. email. How are individuals like this receiving their training? How do we prepare them? It's not just you've hired the right person by well, their... Well, internal, external training. Yeah. So, so uh, how do we get, how do we build that up? Okay, so first of all, a few years ago, um, I, w I was uh, trying to convince uh, uh, lawyers, basically, that they should enter this field mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that they should uh, contribute to develop this field, provide high-level counsel, etc., etc. Uh, I must say, with uh, very little success. Okay? The, uh, more recently, uh, they, 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 they saw the opportunity with compliance and new laws, mm -hmm. like uh, the famous uh, Loi Sapin II, uh, <coughs> which is basically the French uh, FCPA. And UK uh, anti bribery law, right. I would say, with uh, potential very high standards, mm -hmm. uh, depending mm -hmm. on the way it mm -hmm. is applied. Uh, <coughs> but I felt uh, very early that in the academic environment and in the professional environment, mm -hmm. um, there was a need to uh, to understand and to address the ethical issues, and it was quite difficult. And one day I got a visit from. Uh, Two professors from the University of Pontoise who were looking for for found mm -hmm. um, uh, for uh, a business um, um, sorry a legal and uh, business ethics uh, chair I don't know how if it's a proper term in English mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, and. Uh, I didn't know them, so we just uh, we had a conversation that lasted a few hours. And I say, no, I'm not ready to found, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, to found uh, to found this. But I would agree to found help open my uh, um, my address book mm -hmm. um, if you uh, create because we must do it a degree. A degree yes. in law and business ethics. Okay, so and so we had a conversation. They start to we start to think, but I say, okay, it should be done now. It's not a project for three years from now or two mm -hmm. years from now. Mm -hmm. We must do it right now, and do it international, do an international degree mm -hmm. to the largest extent possible. Uh, so we train students at the same time on the legal issues, but also on the. Um, Business ethics uh, issues, and I really felt it was uh, it was necessary. We worked beautifully, and it leads to the creation of, uh, to let's say, to my knowledge, to the first legal degree mm -hmm. in uh, business ethics, mm -hmm. um, probably in the world yeah, at and that time. Do you see at the University of Sergi Pontoise, right. they did a magnificent job. Um, it was also important to create links between um, the North American way of thinking and the European way of thinking. It's different, uh, different approach. Mm -hmm. And when I say North American, it's of course the U.S. is prevalent, but there are very interesting things going on in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, where it's more mixed between the European thinking and the Anglo-Saxon approach. Correct. And it's a great mix. Really, I think it's a, it's a beautiful source. You know, Canada is very well known for its uh, uh, gold mines. <laughs> and uh, ethics in Canada mm -hmm. is, uh, I don't know if it's a gold mine, but it's close. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, great thinking, uh, very interesting. <coughs> so 
they agree to work on this, send students to the US every mm -hmm. year for a learning mm -hmm. expedition. Uh, right. There are great academics from the States sure. who also go to Sergi Pontoise right. to teach. I think it's very good. I always felt that it was uh, important to, uh, to make this, uh, this bridge mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, and to, uh, to develop it. Now, one of the issues we, we see in uh, many ethical, compliance and ethical circle is, um, is, is a um, type of uh, growth crisis. Okay? Mm -hmm. There is a generation that has been uh, uh, pioneers, let's put it that way, um, that really learn as they walk, um, uh, had a fantastic courage uh, to raise issues and uh, it hurt for many of them, for those who had the most courage, it really hurt their career to an extent that is uh, unjust, improper in mm -hmm. a civilized society. Mm -hmm. But that's the, the price also for uh, it's terrible, but it's an individual high price for uh, advancement of mm -hmm. the matter. Mm -hmm. um, these are uh, type of, for the field, silent uh, heroes, I think. They and are like are resistant. Within the field of ethics and professionals, do you yes. have these, these, the pioneers? I think, they are, okay. Yeah, okay. I think they were pioneers. Okay. The people who were the first uh, generation Mm -hmm. uh, who really want to uh, to move things? Who are serious about moving things? Right. I think they many of them suffered mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. than they should have, but it helped tremendously to push in the mm -hmm. right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, now one of the issue is the next generation. That's an issue I'm concerned about. Yeah. Is who's next? Sure. And it's it's uh, it's super important. Well. So um, I think it's, uh, it has to do, of course, with what is going on in academic institution, but right. much beyond. It's also what is going on in all these professional organisms and associations, right. and their willingness to, uh, for the, uh, let's say, uh, for the most senior uh, people around, mm -hmm. to leave their seat to younger people. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's important, that too many co um, I mean same blood and it's not good we need to mix the blood we right. need to mix the generation sure. we mix we it's so important and it's also to mix uh, millennials with generation Z it's not the same correct, um, correct. to um, and and uh, it's a it's a challenge mm -hmm. uh, it's an ethical challenge by sure. the way of course it's an ethical challenge but it's um, I think it's very important because uh, I include myself. Mm -hmm. There are issues, I understand, I'm very curious, very, uh, I'm fascinated by what is going on. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, uh, being up to date to, uh, mm -hmm. to the, the changes, the new technologies, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's crucial, but at the same time, there is a legitimacy issue. Because, mm -hmm. uh, to which extent am I legitimate to 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 create or to the the world of tomorrow? Uh, sure. And I will not be part of this world. Sure. Sure. So, I think that uh, the people who will be in charge in the next fifteen years mm -hmm. should have a seat at the table now, right oh. now. It's crucial. Okay, let me then tie the beginning of our interview with where we are right yes. now. Okay, and that really is we talk about the next generations, plural, who will come in this field to continue, we hope, growing the field of ethics. You know, let me just share a, a story. In, I think it's, it was in 2011, mm -hmm. there was a meeting in Berlin with, um, uh, with a business dean, mm. with the dean of the main business school. Okay. okay you have, uh, an, understand, two uh, professional associations mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. share the responsibility to give accreditation okay. to the main business school. And one of the two had uh, its uh, yearly congress in, 
in, in Berlin and another year it's in Paris and then they go on to other great cities. Right. Um, and uh, I was asked uh, to, to be a keynote speaker in uh, the last day of this uh, convention. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the expectation was to have a nice speech, um, European uh, style probably, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. with great ideas. I have none of them. I, d I had no clue. I was sick the whole night before oh dear. and uh, had so much difficulties uh, to, to find out what I would say. Really, and uh, an hour before, I just had an idea: is to think about the major scandal in the previous ten years, and to say, mm -hmm. where are the people coming from? The mm -hmm. people who were, who had an active role in this scandal, who had who had the criminal activity. Mm -hmm. Most of them are coming from the top business or law school in the world. So, so I told the deans, look, uh, I don't have much to say, but this I'm very concerned about because you are the papa maman, you are right. the alma mater. That's yes. your kids. Yes. That's your kids. So what did you do? And what are you doing now to fix it? Right. It was a bit of an outcry. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, when, when I say that, I think they were very upset that I raised this issue. Uh, okay, so be it. Um, I don't feel sorry. I really <laughs> think it was the right thing to do uh, at the moment. Okay. And what uh, concerned me is that one of, uh, one of the attendees uh, said, but you realize it means that we'll have, because I said, you know, ethics, should not be a standalone class. Okay, ethics should be embedded in mm -hmm. accounting. Should be embedded in finance. Should mm -hmm. be embedded in marketing. Should be embedded in each class. Okay, right. And he said, yeah, "Wait, it means we have to re redraft our class." I was uh, shocked about this response. Really, it was not uh, expecting because mm -hmm. I had such a high <laughs> idea of uh, academics right. and of these schools. And I thought so highly um, of this environment that suddenly I was confronted with a tough reality is that you have human beings yes. who just, they don't want to, to, re to rewrite uh, part of their right. class, okay? This laziness, that is, Intellectual it's laziness right. was a big disappointment. Yes. And so you encountered practically the same kind of change resistance that you spoke about at the beginning of our interview mm -hmm. with your own senior team. Start in the field to make a change rather than starting with, with the But core now you have managers, yeah. senior managers, executive managers. Right who were raised professionally yes. in this environment with this additional way of thinking. Right. And uh, I think they do great, super happy. Yes. We have great uh, relationship. We discuss very easily about uh, uh, some complex uh, subject. There's no judgment. Um, and it's uh, fantastic. Yes. It will continue like this. Right. I'm really super okay. optimistic. Then, th then on this good note, we shall end. Thank you so much. Thank that you was to you. fabulous.